Okay, afternoon everybody, um, and thank you very much for joining us in this session, which is aimed at unlocking water, uh, uh, sanitation and human settlements infrastructure as a critical part of our infrastructure investment efforts um, in the third phase of the recovery. And uh, I've got a few of my panelists who are joining me uh, uh, this afternoon, the first of which is uh, Mr. Sizwa Tati, who is uh, here on behalf of the Minister of Water and Sanitation, uh, Minister Lindy Wesisulu. A welcome to you and uh, also have uh, Chris Campbell, who is the CEO of Consulting Engineer South Africa, who joins us. Welcome, Chris, and also joined by uh, the CEO of the South African Forum of Civil Engineers, uh, Mr. Webstam Febe. Mr. Febe, welcome to you. And also joined by the CEO of the Water Research Commission, uh, Desigen Naidu. Uh, a big welcome to you as well. And uh, also joined by uh, Mr. Dandaz Vimba, uh, who is the CEO of the Municipal Infrastructure Support Agent. And I'm also joined by Heather Jackson, who is the head of impact investment uh, at Ashburton Investments, and also who is with uh, industry body, uh, the Association of Savings and Investments, South Africa, ASISA. Um, and maybe, I guess, just to start us off, if we could get some opening remarks um, about some of the work that your respective organizations are doing in this space, um, and uh, as a way to, I guess, locate your interest and your participation uh, in this space. And Chris, I'm going to start off with you. and. Uh, We'll move our way towards Mr. and Heather, and then we'll get remarks from Desigan and Dandazo as well. Chris, you seem to be muted. Um, muted? Sorry. So, perfect. Minister, fellow panelists, facilitator uh, Ayabonga, and listeners across the country. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and allow me to briefly introduce myself as the CEO um, of Consulting Engineers South Africa. I'm a civil engineer uh, with over 35 years of experience in engineering and management locally and internationally. My organization has been in existence for 68 years and enjoys a volunteer membership as an industry association in consulting engineering of over 560 companies. Um, in employing, it did uh, over 10,000 engineering uh, professional practitioners. It's always been our intended strategy to, over the past few years, partner with government in delivering excellence in infrastructure. And indeed, uh, I think this is the new dawn. Uh, we, I would like to reiterate, we are a, a continuously transforming organization with the full awareness of the demographic challenges the construction industry faces, which we deliberately track and, um, uh, and encourage our members to embrace as we all become and all mm. should have been by now part of what the new South Africa looks like. And in doing this, we have uh, totally reliance on the feedstock for future leadership in our companies um, who, in essence, provide infrastructure solutions and professional services, not only to water, sanitation, and human settlements, but across the spectrum of infrastructure. And uh, I'd, I'd like to close here by just saying that our member companies are ready and eager to get into action in providing the requisite expertise with the integrity at this most exciting time. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much for that input. And uh, I certainly could see how eager your organization is because I allowed you to skip the queue. Um, uh, uh, and allow me maybe to, to rectify that and uh, bring up uh, Mr. Siswa Tati, who is uh, with us uh, uh, this afternoon uh, uh, on behalf of the Minister of Water and Sanitation. Uh, uh, Mr. Siswe, the uh, platform is yours, and uh, uh, if we could get some opening remarks, and if you could just also give us a brief sense of uh, your role as well, uh, um, uh, close as it is, of course, to the uh, infrastructure development framework. Mr. Tati? Sorry, I was muted. Good afternoon okay. to all sure. members of the panel. Uh, to you, Ayabong. As I indicated, probably now what I run, I'm coming as chairperson of National Housing Finance Corporation, 
albeit having to represent the minister. So everything that I'll be putting forward today is more from the perspective of the department. Uh, it carries two portfolios. It is water and sanitation, as well as the human settlement part. And I propose to skip to split even those presentations so that I don't overlap on them. I'll start with the water side and then subsequently deal with issues that um, I expected from a human settlement point of view. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tati, for that. Uh, uh, let me bring up uh, Mr. Webster Mfebe, who is the CEO of Consulting Engineers South Africa, uh, to introduce himself. Thank you, Zenta and fellow South Africans. I'm Webster Mfebe, the CEO of the South African Forum of Civil Engineering Contractors, SAFSEC, an 81-year-old industry board for civil engineering contractors, whose members are the biggest investors in the, construct, in the construction, uh, capital expenditure <coughs> and skills development in the country. For an example, of the total of four construction subsectors in our country, our constituency, roads and civils, uh, contribute 70% of skills development levies to the construction sector. As civil engineering contractors, we permeate every aspect of societal life by providing solutions to the developmental needs of humanity. We build South Africa's civil infrastructure. We build roads, bridges, tunnels, and railway systems that connect communities and economies. We build airports, dry and seaports, oil, gas, electricity facilities that drive commerce and industry. Most importantly for this panel discussion, we build water and sanitation systems that are vital in the restoration of human dignity to sustain lives and livelihoods in order to avert preventable disease and death and recognize water and sanitation as a basic human right that is also a key resource that drives the country's economy. Adequate water and sanitation services are even more critical and urgent under the current COVID environment. We also build foundations and structures and all the hidden underbelly civil services of every human settlement in residential and commercial buildings. According to the World Economic Forum globally, eight out of 10 risks over the next 10 years are environmental with the water crisis featuring prominently. Lastly, the water crisis is also among the top five short-term risks with 86% of respondents expecting it to increase in 2020. This is very bad news given the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to act collectively now and the civil engineering contractors are pivotal in the delivery of infrastructure that sustains lives and livelihoods. Thank you. Mr. Mfebe, thank you very much for, for those remarks. And uh, I guess it makes for a perfect segue into answering the question of how do we finance some of this? And uh, we joined uh, for our panel as well by uh, uh, Ms. Heather Jackson, Head of Impact Investment, <laughs> Head of Impact Investment at Ashburton uh, Investments, and also a member uh, of ASISA. Uh, Heather, um, afternoon to you, and uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Ayabonga. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm looking really forward to this panel discussion. Um, I think it's a critical time for us to forge ways of working in collaborative partnership between public and private. Um, and I'm happy to say we've been doing that for quite a number of years. So um, I'm looking forward to sharing some of those experiences um, and what I think is possible um, in the sector. But I, I wear two hats. So firstly, representing our savings industry body, ASISA, um, and then as an impact investor at Ashburton, where we built up some of these blended finance um, strategies over the years. Um, I must say that uh, for those of us who've been working through ASISA for many years now to tackle the challenges um, you know, across infrastructure that we, we know we have in South Africa, we've worked with the PICC, NEDLAC um, and others over the years. And um, I must say many of my industry colleagues are saying that this SIDS drive feels different. Um, like this is, I guess we're all responding to many crises um, and that this is really a serious um, you know, move and, and with, with serious intent and, and commitment. So, um, yeah, really looking forward, <clears throat> excuse me, to this discussion. Um, we are working on a very exciting initiative that is specifically related to the water and sanitation 
um, sector at the moment, um, and, and I look forward to sharing some more of that with you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Heather. Uh, I'm now going to call up uh, from, I guess, one of the foremost organizations in our national system of innovation, uh, the Water Research Commission, their CEO, uh, Desigan Naya Desigan. Uh, platform is yours uh, to introduce yourself. Thank you, sir. It's lovely to see you, Aya Bonga, and greetings to all the panelists. And it's a privilege for uh, this roundtable sponsored by Minister Sisulu. Uh, my name is Desigan Naidu. I am from the Water Research Commission. It's uh, an old institution in this country. It's part of the family of Science Council. It's all of 49 years old this year, and for the past 26 years, uh, we have played quite a pivotal role and a very proud role to contribute to the development of this new democracy. By definition, our business is research and innovation. We want to organize for knowledge-driven solutions to many of our problems and challenges, but we want to go beyond that. We want to organize for the innovation to lead into business development, to lead into the possibility of new industrial platforms, and transform our water and sanitation landscape in the country. We work very closely to both the departments uh, under Minister Sisulu, but also uh, many other departments in government, as well as the private sector. Uh, and th the key idea is to organize ourselves to take this very successful enterprise that we've had for many years in South Africa around water, because we have water security in a very arid country, but take it to the next level, the next level of water security, the next level of dignified sanitation services in the context of the 21st century around the new solutions and around the new possibilities. Mm. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Desigan, for that. Um, and uh, let me call up now from the uh, Municipal Infrastructure Support Agent uh, Mr. Ndanda Zovimba, and uh, they do a lot of interesting work in uh, trying to extend capacity and capability uh, on many of the infrastructure projects undertaken at that level. Mr. Vimba, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Facilitator. Good day my, to my fellow panelists. My name is Ndanda Zovimba. As you have indicated, uh, Mr. Facilitator, I'm the CEO of MESA. Uh, briefly, MESA is a fairly young uh, agency of government, the government component, which are set up uh, following a, a comprehensive assessment of the state of local government in 2008 and 9, which culminated to the adoption by cabinet of what was called the local government turnaround strategy. In that strategy, there were a number of interventions that government uh, set to do and one of those interventions was the capacity support organization that must be set up to support municipalities, in particular to close the gap that was identified in, as it relates to the engineering capacity and technical skills in general in municipalities. So Mr's mandate was therefore to make sure that we support municipalities with infrastructure planning, infrastructure delivery, infrastructure operations and maintenance, and we also build internal capacity of municipalities so that they can, on their own, uh, deliver infrastructure in a more sustainable way. All in all, Chair, we support municipalities at all stages of the municipal infrastructure life cycle. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, uh, Mr. Vimba. And, uh, and I guess that that in a way sets out who is part of our conversation here. We also have about 70 or so people who are joining us as attendees for this conversation and a big welcome to them all. And we will certainly encourage many of them to send through uh, their question and answer uh, or their questions, I should rather say, uh, to some of our panel uh, panelists and even comments. Uh, uh, please feel free to do so on the Q&A tab. Uh, you have a 256 character limit. It's probably, I think, a bit higher than what you would find on Twitter, but uh, we probably don't want the kind of contentious and combative debate that one would find uh, on that particular platform. But that being said, uh, I think uh, uh, um, a lot of the context of why we are having this conversation in the current moment um, is, relates to COVID-19 um, in the first instance, where a big part of the precautionary measures uh, are contingent on being able to have access uh, to sanita sanitation, have access to 
uh, I guess, a shelter. You can't, um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, quarantine or isolate, um, I guess, in a context where people don't have access to shelter. And then, of course, uh, there are the main challenges around accessing to accessing water, which is a critical part of uh, uh, the uh, response. But also, many of the things we're going to be talking about today are part of the constitutional promise of our breakthrough in 1994. And uh, I think if we think about that in that context and also in the context that a lot of the infrastructure we're talking about, uh, a lot of expectations when it comes to jobs, and many of my panelists would have seen the quarterly labor force numbers that came out earlier on today, uh, continuing to add to the bad news uh, about the uh, absorptive nature of our economy or lack thereof. And um, Chris, I want to maybe start off here with you. Um, and maybe before we go to you, Chris, uh, it might be helpful to bring in uh, uh, to this question, because uh, I guess in the context we find ourselves in with the constitutional promise uh, that we have, uh, Mr. Tati, um, what are some of the things that have happened since uh, there's been, I guess, a merger of the Department of Human Settlements and Water and Sanitation? Um, and maybe if you could speak to us about some of the infrastructure projects that are underway, uh, all of which that are really aimed at uh, not only improving the long run growth potential of our economy, but also ensuring that uh, we extend a dignified life uh, to many of our people where they need it the most. Uh, thank you, Ayobo. I guess it's still important, even though we might all be conscious of the broad scheme of arrangements that um, South Africa is facing a serious water crisis that is caused by the insufficiency of water infrastructure from a maintenance investment point of view, but it's exacerbated by the recurrent droughts that are driven by the global uh, climatic variations. There are, there's also a further problem of inequities in access to water and sanitation. The quality of the water is not up to scratch, not to speak about the lack of skills in the sector in terms of engineering, scientists, hydrologists, geohydrologists, and resource economists. I will complete in my assessment, if I don't mention the huge problem of corruption and gross mismanagement, especially at the local government level. And then you have COVID-19, which really pushes the crisis to um, unmeasurable proportions. I thought it's very important that we, we all have the context of that background. The other part, really, when you look into where we are in the future, there is an increase in the water demand. And because of the growing urbanization, our growing population, there are changing lifestyles, and in general, from an industrial point of view, the growth in the economy. All of these put pressure on this very scarce resource of water. I've charged on the, the climate change, uh, the weather is becoming warmer and drier, and all these contexts put together, it put a serious um, stress on, on a limited resource. Climate change, that they, there will be less water available to meet the needs of the people. To date, if I may just mention as well, we have over 3 million people without access to basic water supply in the country. And only 64% of households have reliable water supply. That shows you the, the gap in all those facets. At a municipal level, the gap between requirements and supply is driven by inefficient use. The water losses, which is wastage and leakage, inadequate cost recovery, overconsumption, inappropriate infrastructure choices, aging infrastructure. I did touch on the, the corruption and the cross mismanagement issue. If some of you might recall, in November 2019, the minister launched a national water and sanitation master plan. In developing that master plan for the country, the department had re realized the importance that water plays in the whole economic and social value chain. The master plan, therefore, it articulates an extensive set of actions and investments that the country's water sector must implement between now and 2030 to achieve water security for the country, including equitable access to water, sanitation services for all South Africans, as you mentioned, Chairperson, in terms of the constitutional imperative. The water and sanitation sector currently is not financially sustainable. Therefore, funding needs 
are on the increase and the available funds, as we all know, especially from the pressure of the fiscals, are very limited. This stress on resources is not just local, it's also from the international perspective, where there's reduced revenues, there's accumulated debt by the government, and all of these put pressure to minimize what is available to put into this sector. And that emphasizes how private sector and public sector need to collaborate. Funding of the water sector comprises, as you might all be aware, a capital part of the infrastructure development. But there's also this operational cost, this maintenance along the supply chain, as well as the funding for the governance, in other words, administrative and control part for the effective management of the sanitary services. Capital requirements of the sector, in our estimate, approximate 90 billion per annum. This comprises about 70 billion of water supply infrastructure from source to end user, and about 20 billion for sanitation and wastewater collection and treatment. In 2018, the government estimated the gap at 333 billion over the next 10 years between the funding requirements, which is 898 billion, that is available. Okay, sorry, against the available 565. This funding gap needs to be reduced through a very purposeful intervention, such as the policy reviews, enhanced regulation, implementation of cost efficiency measures, proper management, and the user expectation demands. Further, given the limited public funding that is available through government budget, it's important to ensure that financially viable projects are financed using private sector funding. This will allow our public funds to be focused on priority transformation projects. The interventions to do this will build on the success to date of the trans caledon Tunnel Authority and the Water Boards, which together have in the past mobilized significant loan finance to undertake infrastructure development to supply urban and as well as industrial activity. To strengthen the activity to raise private sector funding, the establishment of the National Water Resource Infrastructure Agency is being proposed. This would combine the operational activities of the National Department the funding and the developmental capabilities of the trans caledon Tunnel Authority and enable funding to be raised on the basis of the sectoral substantial balance sheet. Now, in order to, this, to do this, um, experiences show that the necessary plan for the next 10 to 20 years ahead of the successful stress climate variability, the change as well as the intervention needed to support our growing water needs. We are in the process of reviewing and prioritizing the implementation of the strategic water resource development project, as well as expediting the development of planned ongoing national infrastructure plan to ensure a timely completion to maintenance, to maintain the water security of urban economic centers, such as the Gauteng region, uh, Eteguini, Nelson Mandela Bay, Cape Town. These projects, just to name a few of them, are Mokolo Crocodile West Water Augmentation Project, Zimbabwe Water Project, Nawitwa Zanin Augmentation Project, Full Drift Dam, the Val Kamakara Water Augmentation Project. I hope I've got that pronunciation right. The City High World Highlands Water Project Phase Two, Umkomazi Water Project, and Perhrefil. Um, full flow augmentation scheme. Now, the implementation of the action plan of the program that comes from what was launched in November last year is the following component. The trans Tunnel Authority has already been mandated through ministerial directives to serve as the funding and liability manager for the following projects, which are implemented, which are implementation ready and prioritized for private sector uh, funding. The Lesotho Highlands Water Phase 2, 32 billion uh, project. This will augment the supply to the Val system to specifically meet the increasing water demand from Khauti and other downstream users. Phase 2A of the Mokolo Crocodile River augmentation project. It's a 12.4 billion project. This will increase water supply for energy generation, the Midupi Power Station, whole mining project, 
And phase one of this project is already in operation, commissioned in 2014. Project consists of an abstraction where 160 kilo, kilometer water transfer pipeline with capacity of 75 million uh, cubic square meter per annum. And then you've got Mkumazi water project. It's a 23.2 billion. This one augments water supply to Eteguini Metropolitan. You'll be aware that the recent droughts in the area further expose the current lack of residents of the Mgeni system, that increasing the need for this project. Then you've got Berkfle, full flay augmentation scheme. It's a 798 million project. This one will increase the water security to the Cape Town, the city of Cape Town. This transfer scheme will ensure that the winter rainfall runoff will augment storage in the existing full flay dam. The city and irrigators in the park will benefit from this project. This is a chairperson just to mention a few of the specific projects. Um, I don't know what you prefer because that's the end on the sanitary part, whether I should proceed on to the human settlements. I'll be uh, guided please, by you. please proceed on to the human settlements um, and then we'll uh, continue with Chris thereafter. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Now, the Department of Human Settlements, Water Sanitation, as you all know, plays a contributory role in the post-COVID economy. Almost 4 million house houses benefited by the state since the new democracy. And, and there's another 2 million that is still to be built. Housing construction can be used as a great lever to radically transform the economy and the lives of millions of people, led up to mainstream economy as we all for historical reasons. However, combined impact of the economic downturn has created, as well as COVID-19, has created an unprecedented challenge for human settlement, which requires some out-of-the-box thinking. We don't waste much time, but we all know the contribution of human settlement and the construction industry in relation to the production of housing to the GDP, housing improvements and additions. They also contribute to the GDP, job creation, um, the financial impact from both uh, the leverage from the financial system, rates and taxes. And there's also indirect benefit, as you all know, simply from the social well being of families. Um, there is a very illustrative project, which is a um, very important to highlight if anybody wants to look at what kind of infrastructure and human settlement this country desires most to create better impact. The Waterfall Park, which is a mixed use, mixed income mega residential strategically located between <coughs> trade and employment corridor of Midrand and Park Town. I don't want to bore you with the statistics there, but if you really Google on that project, you will see how much the human settlement from an infrastructure impact point of view can seriously leverage. The South African property market is about 6.1 households valued at over 4 trillion rent. Nearly 4 million households have benefited since the new government has come into power. In fact, there is evidence in the Lightstone research, which is the deeds office data, confirms that less than 3% of the sub 200,000 market segment is actually bonded. Now, that shows you the extent of the opportunity that sits there. From a broader a market segmentation point of view, just to give you some few statistics, in the range of 600,000 house values and above, you have 42% of the total of the people who have been housed in the country coming from that category. And that represents 80% of the rent value on that side. And then on the households, uh, our structures of between 400 and 600, 13% of the population has benefited. That represents only 9% of the rent value. Uh, 300 to 400, only 9%. 200,000 to 300,000, only 10%. And then less than 200 is 26%. You could easily see the, the gap that remains, that the vast part, part of the population of the country still has or living without shelter. 
the government faces a very huge challenge in the post-COVID world, where it, is, it still has to deliver almost 2 million houses as part of this constitutional mandate. The National Development Plan has identified several formidable challenges confronting human settlements, which must be addressed as part of a comprehensive plan uh, to achieve this goal. It talks to well-located land is still expensive. Urban planning and approval processes are still slow. Affordability constraints in the marketplace from a financial access point of view. There are other factors, which I'm not going to bore you so much about. You know, the lack of the secondary housing market is an example in the townships, which shows you how under leveraged the housing stock that sits in the townships still remains today. The new housing programs that have hold, had very low economic scale. Um, those are some of the challenges which typically one would drill deeper if the time was available. Now, the department has taken a view to prioritize some housing programs. Some of these um, relate out of the 18 programs identified because of the pressing economic challenges now, the department has reduced these to four aligned to the areas of the greatest need. One, the informal settlements upgrading. Second is the social housing space. Uh, the other one, the need to really have shelters and opportunities which are enhancing ben benefits and opportunities to, to women and, and people who come from the previously disadvantaged env environment. The first time homeowners, uh, this is a significant market which is not addressed given the, the risk aversion of some of the financial institutions. Just to touch on the other policy challenges, the department recognizes that it needs to review the Home Loan and Mortgage Disclosure Act in order to review even the financial services charger targets that have been set for the banks, because we realize the environment has shifted and the pressures have become even much more acute. The department recognizes that it must review the approach to finance linked individual subsidy program, so called FLIPS program. <laughs> Because less than 5% of, of customers, as we have researched, are still benefit from this program. And yet its potential is far larger than that. We need to remove the ATM moratorium on breaking new ground, a stock that is not conducive to mobilizing capital and wealth. We know that limitation that once you've benefited through that program, you have to keep for a period of about eight years. Um, the other part is really recycling and unlocking debt capital in the RDP and banking new grant programs. Other opportunities still sit in the inner city building projects, the abandoned buildings, as well as the commercial buildings. A huge opportunity sits there and uh, refocus the ambitious mega city projects to include the rejuvenation of inner city. We also see a leverage of pension funds as alternative forms of funding for human settlement. Um, pension funds are significant investors in commercial property. An example of rates, some of you might know. These pension funds could provide a very strong collateral for individuals in the housing loan schemes. So there's a huge potential for that. Um, the other part the department would, has been embarking on is the restructuring of the human settlement entities. We are proposing the establishment of a mega development housing functionary. In other words, an enlarged uh, housing development agency. Some of you are closer to the industry will know about this institution. The department believes its role could be much more, excuse me, expanded, especially with enhanced authority given to it. Creating a very a single human settlement regulatory authority, putting together the estate agency board, the CSOS, SHRA, the department views it is cumbersome and quite expensive to have all these regulatory bodies in their singular form, and there could be benefits if they are amalgamated. To create an architecture for human settlement financial model with the envisaged human settlement development board as the apex housing DFI that will consolidate um, the finance amongst all the other entities. In this respect, we want National Housing Finance, NHBRC, and SHRA to find mechanisms of leveraging the capital and their balance sheets 
to make it available to uh, expand the human settlement investment in the sector. I don't want to get into the detail of the APEX institution, which has been highlighted in my presentation, unless questions come so that they can deal with them. But it is important to highlight that we view the PPPs, private public sector partnership, as pivotal. The state has long realized, including this department, that on its own, it doesn't have sufficient resources to make an impact. And therefore, a partnership and a viable and sustainable one, long term, um, with the private sector is the key. The conclusion, there's no doubt that the housing construction and investment can act as a stimulus to the economy whilst contributing to greater socio-economic political stability. Um, the production of houses for ownership and rental, the huge opportunity, there's a job creation that will come with investment in human settlement. We want to encourage the collaboration with private sector. Um, we also want to promote the cultural mix and diversity so that when we create areas of human settlement, they're not on the basis of the historical spatial income gaps, but to find communities that can intermeddle and promote social cohesion. Uh, Chairperson, let me stop at that, at that level. Thank you very much. Mr. Tati, thank you very much uh, uh, for that. And uh, certainly uh, from the questions that are coming through, uh, many questions uh, and comments emerging there, and we'll certainly try and uh, pick out some of those and engage them. But thank you very much uh, for those remarks. And I think it comes at a very interesting moment. We've got the special adjustment budget coming through in the next day or so, which is uh, certainly said to have major implications on many of uh, the areas that Mr. Tati was speaking about. Uh, we saw in February a 1.6 billion rand reduction in the water services infrastructure grant and about 6 billion rand or so for uh, the urban human settlements grant, which also includes the upgrade of informal settlements. So uh, the big question is, uh, you know, are we going to see a continuation of some of these reductions and what is all of that going to mean? And we'll come back to some of those questions. Uh, at this point, I want to bring in uh, Chris Campbell. Uh, and uh, Chris, you would have heard what Mr. Tati was speaking to and would be familiar with some of uh, the big uh, questions there. And I guess uh, one of the issues that's, that's come out quite strongly from a National Planning Commission report uh, uh, on infrastructure was uh, this challenge of built environment professionals like yourselves, and I guess the paucity or lack of them in many of our municipalities that are charged with delivering this infrastructure. Thanks, Ayabonga. Let's try and unmute you there, Chris. Yeah. Um, Sure, perfect. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I think listening to to the comments uh, from the ministry, I think, you know, I'd like to start just with a headline, for instance, before I go into the capacity challenges and what creates them is, is that, um, uh, you know, much as we could go into some of the technical detail, I think at the heart of the water and sanitation problem, as well as the human settlements is, um, is, key issues around sustainability and quality. And, and, and likewise, in human settlements, for example, we often talk about affordability, but we don't think about sustainability. And I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit more later, but it comes back to quality. Now, where am I heading with this? Um, our procurement systems, as we run them at the moment, um, unfortunately, the, in the infrastructure development process, you start with your built environment professionals. And we put so much energy into trying to discount the services of professionals. Something you'd never do to your medical practitioner. And, and we expect innovative solutions, quality solutions and the like. And, and, and you know, we, we invariably, much as the integrity of the professional is on the line, there's a levels of affordability. So you may find that you probably get just about what you've paid for. And we really need to get back to a system of procuring services in our infrastructure development process, both in human settlements, in water and sanitation, where we consider that we are going to own this as a country for the next 30, 40 years. So you look at it from a total cost of ownership. At the moment, 2% of that cost is attributed to your professional services, and we put the most energy into it. 
We have bucky loads of contract documents and papers and, con and tender preparations. And, and we don't realize that at the tail end, operation and maintenance, which uh, if I take 20% as being construction, that leaves you with another 78% in operation and maintenance costs over the life of the infrastructure, which you're going to end up maintaining more frequently because your starting point was wrong. So we should be looking at how do we commission the services of our, our built environment practitioners where we value their services, that it's equal to the, the innovative solutions and the creativity that we're going to need to be able to do more with less. Then, you know, going into the capacity issues, um, at the moment, a large amount of the engineering capacity does sit in the private sector. The private sector have offered that partnership over a couple of years already. And I, and one understands that, you know, you know, during the, the dark times, um, one might have been a little bit more apprehensive about doing so. But I think moving forward now, it makes more sense to use the private sector interchangeably. Let's, you know, not in a non-corrupt, well-governed manner to supplement and complement the capacity that sits in the state and also to develop capacity that should then reside within the state for the future. Now, some of the own goals we're scoring here is we, we're rapidly killing off an industry. We, you know, simple things like payment. There are large companies and small companies who are bleeding, you know, not even COVID-19 related, um, but well over 120 days of outstanding payment for their services. And, and, and this is ongoing. So, you know, no business can remain afloat at, the, uh, uh, you know, at that rate. I spoke about the onerous tender procedures. I, I, if we are going to get this right, then we've got to look at the cost of doing business. And by this, I mean, if companies have to duplicate the amount of paperwork, the amount of effort in responding to bids, where every municipality, every department uh, tend to differ. It's just, it's an unnecessary waste of resources. So we need to look at how do we streamline that. Um, I know entities like Sandra are looking at um, more condensed processes and, and maybe more should exercise that thinking. And then one of the other issues, which is an unintended consequence of our budgeting process. Most infrastructure projects are not done and dusted in three years. You may start the design in year one, and then you have possibly inefficient uh, regulation, uh, uh, um, statutory approvals, such as what use licensing, EIAs. That chews up all your time. And because we, we tend to have a medium term expenditure framework, which extends over three years, the contract with the service provider gets terminated, but the project's not finished. We've had instances where, for instance, um, I know this is water and sanitation, but the analogy here is the road hasn't gotten to the bridge yet, but the contract has been terminated. And, and we need to rethink that and appreciate the infrastructure true period of construction and build in the efficiencies in the regulatory process. I spoke uh, earlier in my introduction about it's important that we eradicate corruption, both within the private sector as well as in the public sector, because that just sets us back all of the time. And, uh, you know, as an organization, we've upped our ante on that. And, um, you know, we, 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 we would certainly would not hesitate to uh, reconsider members um, as part of our fold if they are found guilty of, of that kind of behavior. And then in terms of creating capacity building, we must consider doing it different the way it was done previously. In the previous pursuits under a different leadership, you know, the notion of creating capacity was appointing a small company, and then the company invariably ended up farming that work out to larger companies. Now, could you create capacity that way? No. So what you need is companies with capacity and know-how to bring on board other companies and build a new capability for the future with a strong emphasis on women, 
in our industry because there's a dire shortage. Um, uh, your engineering council stats of registered engineering uh, female practitioners, you're talking about 8% compared to 90, now 8% female compared to 92% male. In our industry, we've got 24% women um, in senior leadership positions as opposed to 76% male. So I think we, need, we, we do need to put a stronger emphasis on that. And then I think um, finally, if we look at our housing, it becomes very important that, and I mentioned earlier, that we don't just look at affordability, we must look at sustainability. Because much as affordability means that people can afford it at the capital level, but if there's not been enough oversight, not enough proper design and construction, then you compromise the sustainability of that structure and some unwitting family who now, for the first time as a house, finds them having to spend a whole lot of money doing high level maintenance because the house starts cracking up because the foundation's settling when it shouldn't. So, you know, those are key things. And then I think finally, um, because I'm mindful of my time allocation, um, in our endeavors here, I believe that as a country and through water and sanitation, human settlements and in others, other infrastructure developments, we must get away from this feast and famine cycle because much like we led up to 2010 three years too much work complaints of not enough capacity and then boom nothing we need to see this as a, a scaled up ongoing long-term process so we never end up with unemployed graduates who've gone and studied hard, four hard years doing engineering finding themselves unemployed and likewise having our construction companies and consulting companies rapidly going out of business. Um, I, I think I'm going to end there. Thank you. Uh, um. Chris, thank you very much uh, for that input there. And I think you, you raise a lot of um, site level and even more macro issues that uh, I certainly hope we can return to and, uh, uh, and some of the questions that are starting to come through. Uh, many of the other participants picking up on some of the issues that you're raising. I want to bring in now from... Um, uh, the Water Research Commission, the CEO, Desiga Naidu, and uh, they do, as I said earlier on, some fascinating work uh, in our national system of innovation, and uh, we're a water scarce country, and uh, uh, certainly a research institution that has allowed us to at least have some sense of uh, water security over many decades uh, as a country uh, subject to persistent droughts, and uh, Desigan, uh, the platform is yours, um, and uh, I certainly hope uh, that uh, you can certainly take us through some ideas about how we think and answer the call the president made earlier on uh, to uh, also as we expand access to uh, water also do so in a way that innovates as well. Desiga Naidu. Uh, thank you Ayabonga and uh, thank you for those presentations from Siswe and, and Chris as well. Uh, I want to take you on a little journey which is um, a little bit away from what we've been talking about because we need to talk about possibility. But first, I, I just want to emphasize this point, that this moment that we're sitting in is an incredibly difficult moment in the world. COVID-19 has reorganized our thinking, it's reorganized our lenses, it's reorganized our aspirations, but it has provided a crisis point that we should not uh, organize to miss because this crisis should work for us. The really thing I, I want to emphasize is that we have an almost perfect storm that we're looking at in 2020. You know, while we've had this unwelcome disruptor called COVID-19, this is now complementing the serious crises that were already there. We continue to be in the middle of a climate crisis in the world. There are many commentators that say that we haven't really recovered from 2008 yet, and we are in a much bigger hole than we were ever before. And people are now talking about the parallels between 2020 and the Great Depression. And if this is not enough, the multilateral system is under threat in the most serious way. And the trade wars are simply not assisting us to get to the places that we want to be. So this lays out, if you like, the context around which we need to work. But, you know, I come from the Water Research Commission and science institutions are, are engulfed with optimism generally and examine what possibilities might exist. So we should take those same challenges that we have and flip that coin uh, cone around 
and look at the cone of opportunity. Because on the back of innovative res responses in the human settlement sector, in the water and sanitation sector, we can organize ourselves to get to this point of national self-sufficiency. In fact, UN Water is now talking about this notion in the United Nations system of 2023, the Agenda 2023, around accelerating into the SDGs rather than retarding away from the development uh, targets. But in addition to national self-sufficiency, South Africa knows more than most other people in the world the real importance of operating as a region, that the international partnership is absolutely paramount. And on the back of the national self-sufficiency, we can organize ourselves into a regional economic guild. And Ayabonga, this will tickle your fancy. This is a good route to global competitiveness and partnership. So what is this based on? So the work that we do in the water and sanitation sector, together with all of our partners, and we have tremendous partners, and I'll talk about them just now. One of the main theaters of operation of all of these new innovations that we're trying to put into the system is, of course, the human settlements domain. And the goal is, as the previous speakers have pointed out, to organize for sustainable human settlements that have the ability to see to many of their securities within the borders of that municipality and reduce our ecological footprint into the rural areas. So a couple of these components, uh, which you'll be very familiar with. One is this notion of water sensitive design. Designing not with the roads first, as many of the designs work, but organized to work with what resource availability you have in the system and organized for the system to organize itself in a way that increases its security rather than decrease its security. Alongside this comes the notion of very smart wastewater management. In fact, our wastewater treatment plants are, in fact, the energy plants of the future. And we have a really powerful network of water boards in the sector, as you will well know, and these places serve as test beds for us around the new technologies that we want to put into the system. And if I can point out one example, uh, the headquarters of Bloom Water, which is based in Bloemfontein, does not run on the ESCOM grid anymore. It actually utilizes the conduit hydropower from the water system to run the entire headquarter needs for energy inside, uh, inside Bloom Water. This is remarkable, and it's been internationally acknowledged as well. Then there's the issue of supply diversification. For far too long, we have been concentrating only on organizing to extract the water from the river system, the surface water in particular, we're now pushing that envelope to include much more groundwater into that system, to include ground management as one of the major, major, major contributors to the water security of the system. And we know we can do it because we've done it during the drought and we compare our numbers to the global numbers. The global average for use per person per day is 177 liters. South Africa is the 30th driest country in the world is at 253. We are a wasteful nation. So our water security depends on us, both with the diversification as well as much more controlled use. Then there's the issue of water quality. Because while all of the risk registers are talking about the notion of water crisis as to the availability of the quantity of water, the reality is that a particular quality, otherwise we can't use it at all. So the water, the water quality environment becomes absolutely pivotal. Into this mix, we put in the, the idea of synergies between sectors. And this is the water energy food nexus, which is something the WRC is currently leading. There's the whole notion of new sanitation. The WRC and South Africa can proudly count themselves as part of the leadership in the world with the reInvent the Toilet program sponsored by the Gates Foundation and more recently organizing for new standards to enable us to move into space. And there is, of course, the revolution. And I think there's a reasonable argument to be made that we have been thrust into this fourth industrial revolution in a most dramatic way from a most unexpected source. And that's a little coronavirus uh, called COVID-19. We are in that world right now. So why am I confident that this can actually happen? Well, because we have a highly productive team in this country in the domain of water research and innovation. 
universities in the system, all of the public research institutes and many private uh, institutes as well. And I'm very happy to say that although this community of practice is really small, we're talking about 3,000 full-time equivalent researchers, we rank in the top 20 in the world with regards to production of this new knowledge. So this innovation organizes for us, one, to get to the point of much more sustainable human settlements, but two, it gives us a very specific advantage point in the world because COVID did what 50 years of negotiations in the United Nations could not do. It has flattened the landscape. It has organized to drastically create the opportunity to change the patterns of consumption and production in the world. We have the possibility as a country, we have the possibility as a continent to become one of the major production centers in the world. And this must talk to the kinds of infrastructure that we need. So colleagues, this, this new industry platform is something that is promising. And we are in the month of June in this country where we talk about youth and we remember 1976. This is a eureka moment for youth leadership. And maybe this is the antidote to the stats that we heard earlier today around the labor force report. But there are many dimensions of this is around the new innovations, the new know-how, but it has to be supported by a system. And part of that system, and one of the advantages we can use, are the issues around standards and certification. This is a very quiet revolution, a quiet revolution that is led by innovation, but one I think we need to make a lot more noise about. So the WRC in South Africa, together with the SABS, was part of a small consortium of countries that has to engage one of the promising things that we have in our system. If we want to extend that SDG 6.2 target to the point of universal access to safe sanitation in the world, it's not going to be on the back of waterborne sewerage systems. They're far too capital intensive on the one hand, and two, they use a huge amount of water and we don't have a lot of that. So the non-sanitation work has been going on for many years. The thing that has prevented it from getting into the marketplace is the lack of a standard. We're not willing to go that extra mile. So this consortium of players organized to develop an ISO standard, an ISO standard 3500 uh, for non sewage sanitation, and South Africa followed very quickly. And the SABS is organized to make us only the second country in the world to have a national standard, and this is SANS 3500. And these kinds of enabling factors in the environment will be what organizes for us to have the industrial platforms that we desire. Then the last thing I want to emphasize uh, in this presentation is that we must use our science to good use. So one of the more important contributions around our COVID status in this country, around getting past this epidemic, is the ability to use wastewater as a community level marker for the uh, occurrence of the virus and the infections. The basic idea is to pick up uh, the mRNA, an indicator of the presence of the coronavirus, amplify a level where you can see the signals and then monitor the system and create a heat map for the country as a whole, which tells you where the hotspots are, just tasting, testing the wastewater. And this allows you in a triage mechanism for the health workers to go in and do the one-on-one -on -one in where the hotspots are in the country. But more important than that, it allows us a surveillance tool to see how our interventions are working around us. And we want to see how this heats up in various centers, how this moves along the world on this map. And eventually, the success of the intervention should organize for us to see a cooling down of that heat map as we're moving into the future. But that is not enough to get as a dividend what we want to do, because the back end of this is to organize for the structure of the water quality monitoring system in the country as a whole. Because we don't only have to worry about the COVID virus, we have to worry about the general pollution that are increasing with time, as well as the hormonal treatments. So we need a national system to be able to organize to to engage all of these matters. Now, why is this all important? Because, you know, as was said earlier, 
one of the top five risks in the global risk register for the last nine years in a row has been this issue around the water crisis and the various dimensions of the nature of the water crisis. So the ability to provide water security in the system will not only help us to build a water industry in the country, as envisaged by the IPAP chapter on water and sanitation, but more than that, it de-risks the other investments that need to happen inside the system for us to be able to build the kind of industrial framework that we want inside this country. And this extends beyond ourselves. You know, one of the core points of Agenda 2023 as a continental plan is this grounding in innovation, this grounding on knowledge-driven solutions, this grounding in high-level capacities that we can create inside the system to be able to move the system along. And the last point I want to make is that we're sitting at a moment in history which is incredibly ironic. In the world today, not just in South Africa, as what we saw in the late before survey in South Africa is replicated all around the world. We have the highest level of skill in our unemployed cohort in the world today. We certainly have that in this 30 odd percent in this country as we sit today. It is our business to create the right kinds of opportunities to start industrializing water and sanitation, putting people to work increasing our water security, increasing our investment potential, increasing our direct earnings from the global markets. So Chair, with those couple of words, um, I will rest there. Thank you very much indeed. This is going to thank you very much for those uh, uh, remarks and uh, um, giving us certainly a lot to uh, ponder and think about. Um, uh, certainly, least of all, I mean, from the regulatory perspective, and uh, I'm still quite shocked that um, it, it took us as long as it did to, to just sort out uh, the standards issue. And maybe that's a theme we can return to. Uh, now, a big chunk of what the president spoke to earlier on this morning was about getting collaboration um, in funding, um, not only funding, but even building and operating uh, a public infrastructure. And uh, my next a guest is certainly somebody who has been part of many of these conversations over uh, over many years. Um, her name is Ms. Heather Jackson, and uh, she is the head of impact investment at Ashburton Investments, and also a uh, somebody working quite closely with the industry body ASISA on some of these questions. Heather, the platform is yours. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just struggling a little bit to share. So I think you are the presenter, so you, you should be able to share. Um, yes, there we go. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> Is that working? Are you are you seeing that presentation? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, great. Sure, Des, again, that was um, quite a depressing note to to end on. I was not aware that we had the um, most skilled. A component to our unemployment rate, which is already the highest in the world. Um, but as you say, um, the optimists amongst us will say, don't waste a good crisis and don't waste that kind of quality. Um, and I certainly subscribe to that. And, and um, thank you to all the panelists. Um, it's great to see that there's some activity happening in the space. Um, I think you're absolutely right that we need uh, more innovation. Um, and hopefully the kinds of this crisis really is the impetus that we, we need to actually find more creative solutions. I, I do think um, as an industry, we sometimes lack imagination um, and that, you know, that can't be too, too difficult to fix. And, um, and, and when the demands are upon us in the way that they are, um, then, you know, hopefully it just takes us up a, a several notches that, that we need to, to um, band you together, to work together, to, to figure out solutions. Um, so I think like many things, the, the current crisis is highlighting unsustainable trends that were already happening. I mean, this image is back from 2014 um, and it's exceptionally bad or was as it, as it was, but it's also certainly highlighting or, and heightening the urgency for government and private sector to work together more effectively uh, to forge a more inclusive growth path. I think we've, and many of us have alluded to it, we already knew we had the highest unemployment rate and amongst the, the most um, unequal societies in the world going into this COVID crisis, we've also 
um, had plenty of evidence of crumbling infrastructure and enormous challenges um, in sectors like our water and sanitation, our, our human settlements, um, which is also, of course, so crucial for our health response. Um, and and you know, they're all integrally um, linked. And so where I'm coming from is I believe that impact investing and blended finance solutions can really help to solve many of these um, challenges. So these are surmountable. Um, blended finance, if I can just go to the next slide, um, is defined by the OECD as the strategic use of government development finance for the mobilization of additional private finance towards the sustainable development goals in developing countries. Um, and really the glue for the, these kinds of blended finance solutions is an alignment, a recognition between both the public and the private partners um, that recognize that we need to do more towards achieving the sustainable development goals. And of course, as we all know, these are very closely mapped to our own national development plan. Um, investments um, and areas that, that work towards um, these development goals in social um, infrastructure, be it in better access to healthcare, clean water, education, uh, and affordable housing, have been predominantly left in the hands of governments, I think, um, especially the large infrastructure projects, um, and as well as the development banks like our DBSA. And, and yet we know, and this is a global phenomenon, but I think it's you know accentuated here, that this, this source of funding is both uh, insufficient and unsustainable. And where we come along as, as impact investors working in these blended finance strategies is we say we can work with a development bank, for example, and packaged correctly and, and providing attractive risk and reward characteristics. Um, these are investment areas that can see much more private sector investment. So coming from the likes of your pension funds um, and not necessarily only local pension funds, insurers, um, you know, long, long, um, long dated um, entities who, who require those kind of long term steady returns that infrastructure can can deliver on. Um, so we know that climate change will disproportionately affect those at the base of the economic pyramid. Um, and as we are experiencing with the coronavirus related deaths and job losses, unfortunately, the same is true in this in this pand pandemic. Um, the crisis has really urgently highlighted the case for more purpose-driven, inclusive uh, finance across both environmental and social sectors. Um, and, and this is, of course, core to impact investing. So I just want to give you a couple of practical examples, because I think, you know, I listened to some of the speakers in the plenary session um, earlier, and I could not agree more that we need to focus. Um, it's, it's no good kind of having a big, um, broad, you know, spray and pray approach. Um, I think we need to be focused and we need to be bringing in and you know some of the panelists here, the, the engineering components, um, you know, the, the, the water boards, um, government certainly, um, private sector across the gamut of banks, um, fund managers, pension funds, insurers. Um, and, and, and so, you know, and I know from, <laughs> from experience, these are not simple uh, matters. Putting together blended finance solutions are complex, challenging, um, iterative, uh, sometimes frustrating, but I want to share with you um, one that has been, I think, very successful. Um, and it's one I'm, I'm proud to have led, um, which is where back in 2013, 2014, uh, we partnered with our National Treasury's Jobs Fund program. Now that invited innovation to job creation solutions. And um, we went to them and, and, and we said, it was a one for one matched principle and we said actually we think if we put in place a guarantee mechanism to give comfort to our pension fund investors we'll be able to leverage that 10 times which um which which we've done so um over time with 150 um, million rands worth of guarantees we've raised and continue to raise but our funds are not closed yet about one and a half billion rands and that in turn has led to over thirteen thousand sustainable, decent, permanent jobs um, uh, uh, being created. And the key takeout actually from that um, is that what is crucial um, is that you have a capable state that oversees this process. So I have to say in and of ourselves as private sector, I don't believe we would have um, 
created the kind of quality jobs and sought those out and measured, evaluated, evidenced those if we hadn't been held to such high standards of accountability from, from National Treasury's um, jobs fund uh, partners. So that, that's been a key learning um, for us as, as private sector. Um, another blended finance solution that I'm really happy to talk more about in, in, in Q&A um, is one that we're currently developing um, and that's one in partnership with uh, GFA, led by Jonathan First. Um, our, and and, and um, our proposal was the first uh, uh, SADC one to be awarded from the Global um, Climate Finance Lab, which is based out of the, the US. Um, and it's focused on unlocking capital for the critical areas in water, sanitation, and health. Um, so it's very relevant to this, this panel. Um, the Finance Lab is funding us to develop a robust platform that enables the banks, the fund managers, the pension funds to align in funding, building um, and managing uh, critical water infrastructure across SADC. Um, and we're targeting an initial capital raise of $125 million uh, once we are endorsed, hopefully in September. Um, and we think that this is a model that could be replicated in other sectors. Um, our industry body, ASISA, have also been quite involved in terms of advising us. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's our intention that this is um, a platform that is used more broadly to, um, to raise infrastructure if we can prove concept here. Um, but our, again, our key, uh, our, our, from our experience, the key take out is that for these solutions to bear fruit, they must be led by capable um, state functions that work collaboratively and flexibly with private sector um, and, and, and hold all parties to account. And so the last slide that I want to share with you is, um, I, th I think a piece of interesting research that I think is relevant um, in these blended finance, um, private public partnership, um, you know, in, in terms of delivering infrastructure, like in the sectors we're talking about today. Um, and it's some thinking from a prominent economist called Donnie Roderick, who argues that we really need to shift away from traditional approaches to industrial policy more quickly, um, where typically governments assume that they're in control or uh, market failures up front um, and are prone to capture. Um, they tend to approach um, solutions under this sort of traditional approach with quite rigid instruments and ideas. And instead, he advocates that in the real world, there's much uncertainty, of course, um, and changing circumstances. And so the more modern approach would be to assume that failures are actually largely unobservable. Um, we don't have a crystal ball. There are multiple stakeholders with information and that the state capacity itself is endogenous to the economy's workings. So in other words, and, and, and this is the critical uh, requirement, we need a capable state. Um, and then what he advocates is a really strong mirror in creating blended finance solutions, um, which you know we can certainly testify to, as the modern approach relies much more on the identification and ob objectives and constraints through strategic collaboration with firms. And then this very backwards and forwards iterative and, and collaborative um, behavior of learning, of cost discovery, of error detection, um, you know, certainly something that the process with um, partnering with our jobs fund has, has taught us. Um, so in closing, I suppose time will tell, and, and um, I, I'm afraid this is a talk show, isn't it? Um, I think we're all optimistic that we need to roll up our sleeves um, and really uh, succeed at building these kind of blended finance solutions uh, in effective and accountable partnerships um, in these much needed areas in order to propel our country onto the more sustainable and inclusive growth path that I think so many of us crave. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Heather, for that. And uh, uh, I guess uh, a very interesting point there, which uh, answers some of the earlier questions around how do we navigate uh, some of the challenges around financing uh, a much needed uh, public infrastructure. And, um, and we also know that many of the delivery agents uh, of this uh, infrastructure um, where it isn't undertaken by, I guess, regional boards or utilities, uh, are often many of our district and local municipalities. And I think my next guest uh, is the perfect person to speak to about uh, some of the uh, issues that have been raised by other colleagues on capacity, on project preparation, packaging, 
and uh, all of the activities and processes across the entire continent uh, of uh, infrastructure investment. Uh, his name is Mr. Ndanda Zovimba. He's the CEO at the Municipal Infrastructure Support Agent. And uh, Mr. Vimba, the platform is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, can I have the link, Chair, for the content? Uh, thank you very much. I, I will preface uh, my input, Chair, by raising some issues which I think are necessary for engagement today. Uh, the first issue, there is a common refrain, Chair, in this country that there is no shortage of money. We have got trillions and trillions of rents sitting with private sector. At the same time, is a complaint that there is a serious underinvestment on infrastructure. And the question is, what is the problem? And also, private sector will come and say, no, we need shovel ready projects, we need finance ready projects, and so forth and so forth. But, Chair, if you look into the capacity of local government to be able to achieve all these expectations, you will agree with me that there is a lot that needs to be done to foster a partnership between the state and local government. Just to make an example, Chair, on the issue of technical skills capacity that has been raised in local government, to effectively deliver infrastructure projects that are shovel ready, infrastructure projects that are ready, that are bankable. So you need some capacity in terms of uh, engineering capacity. And currently this capacity is not there in most of our municipalities. To illustrate the point of this problem, the, uh, the eight metros have engineers, uh, that is your engineering, engineering professionals, your technologists and technicians, than all the 44 and 25 local municipalities combined. One metro alone has more engineering capacity than five provinces combined. And this is a serious challenge, Chair, Chair that private sector, together with the state, must work together to address this particular challenge. Because MISA, as part of its own mandate, has employed a number of engineers in some of these municipalities, but notwithstanding that, Chairperson, there is still a huge gap that I think we need as, as, as partners together with private sector to work together and make sure that this capacity is built. We can't expect that there will be projects that are shovel ready, but we are not working hand to hand with municipalities to build capacity to prepare projects. So I'm challenging private sector that instead of uh, saying, no, there is money, and uh, they have, however, there are no projects, the projects are there, but we need to prepare them. So challenging the uh, chairperson, the private sector to think about this particular issue. Got also instrument person uh, through our intergovernmental fiscal transfers that are there to support municipalities to deliver infrastructure. But if you look at to these instruments, Chair, will agree with me that uh, they are not written, they are no longer fit for purpose. Uh, you will have grants which in the main focuses on building new infrastructure. But if you look into what is a problem today, the real challenge that we're facing today is the access to safe, reliable, and accessible infrastructure. Meaning that uh, we have got to move from a uh, backlog education and, and move towards making sure that we put at the front the asset management in this country. In other words, have more budget uh, towards uh, repairs and maintenance of infrastructure than it is currently the case. And as MISA, we've started uh, uh, some reforms in terms of our own municipal infrastructure grant 
to make sure that the grant uh, is positioned to also look after the existing infrastructure. And also, Chapsin, where the challenges have indicated of capacity in municipalities in project management, and in terms of ensuring that uh, we do proper planning and uh, quality inspections. And we have set up now an inspectorate, which is uh, comprised of uh, chief engineers within NISA, working with a number of sector departments that conduct a uh, regular infrastructure uh, audits in terms of the quality of the new infrastructure being built as well as the quality as well as the audits of the existing uh, infrastructure to make sure that uh, we come up with some alternative uh, technologies to assist in addressing in this respect and also chairperson with a program that was started together with private sector uh, called the private sector participation model this is a partnership between government uh, and private sector in the development of an interventionist uh, model to solve the water and sanitation challenges in particular uh, and make sure that uh, together with private sector we are not just uh, working uh, uh, in silos and we've got a program that we put together in this program already chair we have got the steering committee that has put in place between government which is coordinated by the national department of cooperative governance and hosted at misa as well as the private sector, your PPC, your ASISA, your PLSA, uh, NPI, and BUSA. And the, model, the approach of this model is on the following term to ensure that there is involvement of private sector, not only from the financing perspective, but also from the implementation support perspective. And also the aim is to make sure that we have, we, we do an effective gearing of the future government grant funding uh, to ensure that infrastructure is properly constructed, operated, and maintained, and ensure that through these grants, we are able to crowd in a uh, private sector as well. There are many challenges uh, that I thought I need to reflect on. Uh, challenge number one, uh, Chairperson, the issue of uh, ensuring access to safe and reliable water and affordable housing. And this is a very serious challenge, and if not urgently addressed, we will be failing to meet our constitutional obligations. We've seen a number of uh, institutions taking government to court because of uh, sewer spilling onto the river system and so forth. And this is a serious problem, which uh, is as a result of the underinvestment uh, in, water and in water infrastructure in particular uh, the repairs and maintenance of course of course the issues around the uh, unfavorable economic environment which has been exacerbated uh, by covid 19 uh, uh, and this is proportionately borne more by uh, the poor by the, by the poor and of course uh, the challenge of limited collaboration between public sector and private sector is a challenge and uh, through uh, the district development model, we're looking at addressing this challenge and making sure that uh, we, we, we collaborate with the sector, we collaborate with NGOs and the civil society in ensuring that uh, we address the challenge of uh, development in our country. Just to talk on the issue of the reliability and the uh, challenges, uh, uh, Chen, we will have, first, if we were to address this particular problem, Problem. We need to acknowledge the fact that we have neglected and underinvested uh, in existing infrastructure. And uh, the, the point in case is the 141 water services authorities, which are spending far lower than what they are expected to spend on repairs and maintenance. For instance, uh, including metros, all, of, all, all our municipalities are spending less than 1% on repairs and maintenance yet they are required in terms of the norm to spend at least eight percent on the present and i'm saying chapesin this is a, a serious matter and if not addressed uh, we'll find ourselves in a serious uh, situation and we invite private sector to play a role in assisting us to address this particular problem 
have got a challenge uh, which is a which is is a, is a result of this underinvestment in repairs and maintenance of high non revenue water uh, in this country which is costing us uh, over 9.9 .9 billion annually which is a huge huge uh, problem uh, which is as a result of the failing uh, existing infrastructure due to leaks and so forth and uh, I can like say that we no longer need to think in terms of backlog eradication terms, as I've indicated earlier, but change to a cradle to grave uh, in terms of infrastructure development in our country. And we need to bring uh, asset management uh, to the forefront in local government and advocate and recognize the need to balance between investments in new and existing infrastructure. We are in the current crisis because this balance has not been struck uh, historically and we've got a problem and we're saying we've got to drive a shift uh, in infrastructure thinking through of course using the available instruments uh, and uh, to ensure that uh, we address uh, the challenges at hand and adopt a more agile and a flexible uh, fiscal system as i've indicated earlier instead of focusing more on the on, on building new infrastructure, but be more flexible. If a municipality has got a challenge with around the new infrastructure, the municipality be allowed to prioritize the new infrastructure in using the grant system instead of being forced uh, to budget from their own revenue, which unfortunately uh, they do not have the revenue base. And of course, we have got to broaden our planning horizon a state that does not only think in three to five year cycles, which is currently the case, but takes a longer and more holistic view in infrastructure development. This assists a person in terms of crowding in private sector. Because currently we budget for MTAF for three years. And now you can't then use that investment to attract private sector. Because private sector will then say, no, but uh, I can't uh, 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 invest in, in a funding that is only available for three years. And we're saying we need to have a, a radical shift in terms of how we do our budgeting and have a more longer term view in terms of budgeting and allocate perhaps a municipality for 10 or 15 years against which that grant municipality can then uh, attract private sector to borrow to address the immediate uh, challenges. And of course, the National Development Plan and the National Water and Sanitation Master Plan provide already a starting point for this. And then another challenge uh, uh, of uh, the underinvestment uh, and of course the challenges of coordination, uh, the National Water Master Plan already indicates that there is already a shortfall of about 33 billion that is required for the next 10 years in each year to achieve water security in this country. This is a huge amount of money that is required. Now we need to then get to private sector. How can they close the gap that is there? Otherwise the problem will continue if we don't work together. The state of course is responsible for creating an environment that can attract and, and, and sustain uh, these sectors. And this must be done primarily by, being, by bringing stability into the sector. So we've got the responsibility as government to bring stability in local government, promote transparency, accountability, and predictability in how we do our business as, as local government. Of course, there are serious challenges, uh, as the fellow panelists uh, indicated, the challenges of governance, challenges of mismanagement of, fund, of funds, and uh, as well as challenges of uh, corruption in, in, in the system. We are saying this needs to be addressed by government and by fostering a culture uh, of transparency and also a long-term planning and, and the discipline of execution in terms of our plans. And also the state, we need to build a foundation for investment. And one way of doing this is to structure and indicated area the state investment, which primarily is in the form of grants, to crowd in additional funding from private sector. 
and this uh, the, the state is making a, a sizable investment uh, just in 2019 alone chair is an allocation for water and sanitation and human settlement of 43 billion that goes to local government and this this is the, this is something that can be leveraged and uh, get private sector to 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 to, 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 to borrow and uh, they assist in making sure that we close the funding gap. We also need to think creatively innovatively on the use of other funding avenues that are unchecked. For instance, uh, there's about 8.9 trillion uh, rand uh, sitting uh, in this in, in, in institutional funding like your pension funds, your retirement funds, mutual funds, retail funds. And so forth. And the issue of why there's so much money, but there's still a problem of underinvestment in uh, local government. Of course, the part that needs to be done to look into the regulatory environment, whether is it allowing uh, for, for, for government to tap in onto these funds. I was reading uh, Regulation 28 of the Pension Fund Act, and I realized that there is a serious problem there because it promotes uh, investment only in listed uh, investments, and, uh, and, uh, and, and this is a challenge. So there is no promotion of uh, investment by these funds through the social socioeconomic infrastructure. As a result, the more uh, people who benefit from these funds are offshore investors, which is something that needs to be looked at and, and make sure that we reorientate our pension fund act to look into how do we then invest locally instead of spending more of our funding offshore. So that is the input chair and I have some uh, rhetorical questions that I thought I need to raise uh, to, 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 to my fellow panelists. Uh, Legislatively speaking, for to us, that are we really geared towards unlocking investment in water and, uh, and, and sanitation? Do we address the issue of regulatory constraints that have been raised? And what are some success stories from other sectors that we could perhaps build on or learn from? And to what extent does this issue of limited technical capacity, which I raised, in national, provincial, and local government contribute to the problem, and how do we begin to resolve it collectively? And what is the role of the engineering fraternity in unlocking investment? Specifically, uh, as government, we note that uh, there, is all, there is this perception that all is in the sole responsibility of the state, and professional bodies and associations, uh, they exist here. Uh, to criticize or involve the state, how to turn around this situation and make sure that we work together. And also how we foster better collaboration between the respective institutions represented uh, here today to increase investment in water and the uh, human settlement infrastructure. So that the discussions held today uh, don't just end here, but continue. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vimba, there from uh, the Municipal Infrastructure Support Agent. And I certainly hope all of the questions you're asking, not all of them are rhetorical, because it would be nice to hear some responses uh, from some of our colleagues to uh, some of the uh, uh, big issues that you're raising there, uh, not only just from a funding perspective, but also, uh, I guess, from uh, uh, institutionalized collaboration between the different parties on our call. Now, we're going to move swiftly along uh, and get our last input uh, uh, before we uh, uh, have a few questions, and I'm quite conscious that we probably have, because we started at 10 past uh, uh, two, we probably have about 25 minutes or so. Uh, and uh, I guess once uh, we uh, get the input from Mr. Mfebe, we'll have an opportunity to uh, engage some of the questions that have been coming through. And thank you to you all for sending through those questions, which have uh, ranged from uh, questions around bulk infrastructure right through uh, to questions of uh, water losses and non-revenue water, which are some of the issues that have been raised by some of our panelists. Uh, Mr. Mfebe, the platform is yours. And I be given opportunity to share content. 
Mr. Vimba, if you can, Mr. Vimba, if you can pass the presenter's kosh or conch to uh, yeah. uh, to Mr. Mfeme. Me. Um, I hate to use call it a conch. I mean, if if any of us, any one of us have read Lord of the Flies by um, uh, I forget the guy's name, William Golding, you will certainly know what I'm talking about. Um, Mr. Mfebe, I think you have the conch now. You you may share your screen. Passed it. Thank you very much, Mr. Vimba. Uh, thank you, um, Chair. Uh, firstly, I would like to deal with the uh, five uh, key challenges, and I will go and finish off uh, by concentrating on the true focus areas, value, uh, success factors, and the role of government versus uh, uh, the private sector. Uh, key challenge number one is corruption. Uh, South Africa is rated 70th, 70th in the world in terms of corruption. We need to move beyond the issue of commissions of inquiry and to get people uh, to go to jail for their action. And municipal and uh, SOE governance in the water sector and sanitation remains a high risk in the realization of the NDP and the sustainable development goals. Uh, challenge number two, uh, serious interventions are needed to reduce demand by improving efficiency uh, and in terms of the technologies and reducing losses, especially in the agricultural and, and uh, urban sectors. You can see the three examples of what should be and what should not be. High demand system, drip system is okay, and vertical warehousing uh, system. Uh, the key challenge number three is uh, skill scarcity, and especially the ability of the water boards to manage the assets, and also the issue of the lack of skills at municipality level out of 278 municipalities in south africa uh, there are only uh, 202 civil engineers uh, um, working conditions need to be addressed uh, the key challenge number four is that uh, the municipal wastewater treatment plants are in a dilapidated state, they need to be rehabilitated. 56% of over 1,150 municipal wastewater works are in shambles. Uh, key challenge number five is clean uh, uh, drinking uh, uh, water. 44% uh, of 992 domestic wastewater treatment works are in poor conditions, and this translates into drinking water spilling into uh, water uh, ways and systems. And this problem excludes the private works and industrial treatment. We need to resolve the outstanding uh, problems uh, with relation to the Department of Water and Sanitation uh, for economic uh, projects, the water use licenses, for an example, the project under the Liberal Water Use Association, such as the Orifans Fontaine Weir, Topulukwane Pipeline, the Warp Dam, Black Lishilo Dam, and water use license for the Lipopo Eco uh, Industrial Park. Uh, but before I, I finish, I want to go back to the three areas that I talked about. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Please go ahead, Mr. Oh, Vick. can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. we can hear you. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I thought because it was it was quiet. 
Was one has two uh, no, 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 please, please go ahead. <laughs> okay, I need to go back to the three areas that I talked about uh, value. A uh, project must start with a clear understanding by all parties of the benefits it must achieve. We need to move beyond thinking of value for money as being the lowest tender price. The definition of value needs to be expanded to include issues such as whole life value from cradle to grave, capital and operational carbon emissions, uh, environmental issues uh, should be considered, digital effectiveness, a beam and data capture uh, for indus fourth industrial revolution application, use of standard components and pre-manufactured elements, repetition, manufacture off-site, especially for human settlements, collaborative behavior and supply chain integration, employer, contractor, supplier, fair appropriation um, of uh, risk and reward, not one-sided, uh, and the risk left with the contractor, uh, social value of the construction process, there must be local benefit, health and safety and well-being during the construction is, is of paramount importance, R&D and innovation, there is little and or no R&D that takes place in the South African construction industry, supply chain incentivization for delivery of innovation, sharing of innovation risk between client and supplier, we either innovate or evaporate. Government should have a set of cost and performance benchmarks for assets and contractors, uh, which represent best practice. Number two, on the issue of success factors, what makes a successful project? Creating demand through the short, medium and long-term government project pipeline, which is credible and sustainable, and it needs to be open and transparent so that contractors can plan in advance for training, uh, local involvement, et, et cetera. Not based on overly optimistic or distorted cost estimates or behavior that deliberately underestimates costs and overestimates benefits for strategic advantage. Uh, we need realistic budget. Stakeholders uh, should be engaged at an early stage of the project to minimize scope creep and uncontrolled scope changes during implementation. That speaks to the issue I'm passionate about of early contractor involvement. Contractors are always left out of the, imp of, 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 of the planning stages until implementation stage when problems are being encountered due to uh, going to market uh, with projects that are premature and poorly designed. Sensible planning and programming is undertaken ahead of implementation. Realistic programs based on proper project preparation to de-risk projects and create investor appetite. Procurement documents are formatted and compiled in a standard manner with standard conditions of tender and forms of contract and established requirements in a clear, unambiguous, comprehensive and understandable manner. Standard inquiry documents. Standard forms of contract are used with minimal contact amendments which do not change their intended use and shall only be amended when absolutely necessary to accommodate special needs. Appropriate contracting strategies and procurement tactics are aimed at best value uh, procurement outcomes are employed. One size does not fit all. Payment in terms of the contract is made within 30 days as required by the Public Finance Management Act. Project bank accounts where the money is ring faced for the project only. The inherent project involvement in environment and institutional project risks, which are beyond the control of those who are tasked to physically deliver the project, are owed and are appropriately mitigated. Appropriate risk allocation, equitable risk allocation. Disputes between the parties uh, to a contract are resolved quickly and at the lowest uh, level remove bureaucracy from the procurement process. The new proposed procurement bill does just the opposite. Making a profit, of course, is not a say word. Uh, the, the role of government, lastly, government needs to be capacitated to deliver, to deliver infrastructure. Its track record is this, in this regard is very poor. 
We need private sector involvement. Uh, PPPs are critical in the delivery of infrastructure to relieve the fiscals from competing social demands. Only people with the requisite skill, pertinent experience and knowledge must be placed in key positions. Award projects on design build basis places the risk in the hands of the party best able to manage the risk. If you give the contractor at the design and build, we can get Chris Campbell and the guys and we know how to control them, not the government. The project owner appointed by government must be involved and engaged and not just at the monthly site meetings. Regular project performance reporting 2080 rule, periodic external independent reviews, avoid a fractured team of owner, engineer, and contractor. We must be one team to deliver infrastructure, and we need to communicate honestly and open and often in order to deliver the projects effectively. Thank you. Mr. Mfebe, thank you very much for those remarks, and uh, I think they make for a perfect segue uh, into, um, I guess, some of our own reflections of, um, uh, on the basis of some of the questions that have come through. Uh, which I would like for some of our panelists to engage. I'm also quite conscious of um, where we are in terms of time, and I, and I want to maybe marry two different uh, 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 parts of our conversation. Um, and that is uh, to, to uh, I guess, allocate some of the questions uh, and, and maybe where some of my panelists uh, see their responses fit uh, to maybe engage some of those questions. Um, and I guess also, I, I mean, from my end, three related issues that I see. The first is that a lot of what we're talking about this afternoon is really about responding to different dimensions of what I would call our planetary crisis. And that might be climate change and attendant droughts right through to uh, the challenge of pandemics that we find. Uh, and even moreover, uh, some of the issues of corruption that we're talking about uh, really related to some of the social crises of greed uh, and uh, uh, the kind of value systems that we've built. And so there's issues on that level, but also there's issues on a governance and an organizational level. And, and these are the issues of, uh, that uh, Mr. Vimba was raising on a weak repair and maintenance of our infrastructure. One of the questions that has come through is what happens in many of the small towns where some of the pipe infrastructure that reticulates water from the treatment works through to our taps can't even take water anymore. Who finances uh, the uh, refurbishment of some of that infrastructure? And I think those are some of the critical questions uh, that as we wrap up our conversations, I would like some of our panelists to respond to. And maybe the last issue really is about taking a long-term view and innovating and disrupting how we've done things for a very long period of time. Uh, and I think uh, some of the calls that many have made for higher R&D, more innovation, uh, and even thinking differently about our expenditure cycles to crowd in private investment, I think are critical questions uh, that will allow us to, to not only expand infrastructure, but to think of it from cradle to grave as many of our uh, 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 panelists have uh, remarked today. Um, so as we get some of the closing remarks, I just want to make a quick point that uh, to all of my panelists, you know, we've got about 10 minutes or so, uh, we have already sort of run over time. And what I would like for us to do is for you to give us maybe two or three things that you think can be done in the immediate uh, to ensure that we unlock uh, all of the societal investment we can into water, human settlements, and uh, sanitation infrastructure. Um, and then of course also uh, address in any meaningful way some of the questions that you can see in your Q&A panel there that you might think are, are relevant. And uh, maybe if I can go through some of those uh, question is around the closing uh, funding space for many projects, uh, bulk infrastructure. Uh, there's also questions, of course, around, uh, uh, you know, estimates of non-revenue water losses and costs. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the issue of alternative building technology, because we have to think of all of these things in the context of that planetary crisis I was talking about earlier on. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the issues of the sharing of skill and uh, the financing and uh, the role of pension funds as well. So, Desigan, let me start off with you and um, I'll come back to uh, uh, and Dan Dazo and Heather. Uh, we'll also get some remarks from uh, Chris as well and Webster. But Desigan, I'll start off with you. Two or three things we can do in the immediate and maybe your response to some of the uh, issues is around innovation. Uh, thank you, Ayabongo, and, and thanks, colleagues, for those very interesting presentations. Uh, let, me, let me preamble my response with uh, something I've said on a, on a few fora, that we continuously are trying to solve a 21st century challenge with 
firstly, 20th century technology and even worse, 19th century operating rules. We have simply not been dynamic in this domain and, and it shows. You know, what we have is a master plan. And the master plan, and, and the critique would be right if you said that the master plan includes everything, all of the interventions in a total composite. But the idea around pulling some things out and prioritizing that in the short term is an absolute. And and the pitch that I would make is that we have to we have to move outside the box. We have to move beyond that 20th century lock-in. So in the sanitation domain, for example, non-sewage sanitation should be the technology of choice that you can immediately organize to put on the ground and it is the only way we're going to get to the sdg target the second uh, thing that i want to put in that place using the same thing as an example is that you have to have a multiplicity of benefits associated with the intervention i mean the current way we do sanitation is that well there's an end user benefit for the people who get the sanitation service of course but for the vendors, it's only about building the toilets and then maintaining them. It has to go beyond that. And there's been a powerful amount of work being done by a very smart international consortium of people, which includes many South Africans, around beneficiating that waste. Beneficiating that waste, firstly, with regards to energy. We know how we can use this in agriculture, but we've gone beyond that now. We've gone beyond that into the domain of extracting our proteins, high quality lipids, high quality chemicals from human waste. If you then use that as a capsule, then it's very easy for a multiplicity of, of uh, measures to be met. You will provide the service in a sustainable way. You will be creating jobs in the way you develop out that maintenance and operation systems, like we've demonstrated in the WRC with social franchising. But over and above that, in addition to providing new opportunities for manufacturing bases for these new kinds of devices, you go into the domain of the beneficiation and there's genuine profit to be made from beneficiating that waste. You know, uh, the audience may not know this, but already in this country, we have demonstrator plants that are using soldier flies and pulling out liquid fuel, biofuel from human waste for use. So, you know, if you have that total system approach around industrialization, we could almost immediately go into a beneficiation phase in a matter of months, not more than a year, actually. So there's a there's a huge opportunity waiting just outside the doorstep. Okay. Yeah, stop there for yes, now. Again, thank you very much for that. Uh, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, uh, Mr. Vimba, let me bring you in here just on some of the questions. I mean, one of the questions was really around uh, um, you know, how do we sort of rope in uh, and um, I guess overcome some of the considerable constraints uh, um, from a short term banking funding and also long term return, I guess, for pension funds, which uh, is related to the issue that you were raising. How do we effectively, I guess, de risk uh, from a capacity perspective some of the projects that we find in many of our municipalities? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, sure. yeah. Th thank you very much, uh, 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 for Mr. Facilitator. I think the first thing which I think is very critical for me is for the state to acknowledge the fact that we have got to change our fiscal system, and uh, and 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 that that for me is very important. It make it. Uh, attractive for private sector to come and uh, invest. Uh, for instance, indicated earlier, the issue of uh, budgeting for three years, I don't think it's sustainable and it's not attractive for private sector. And how do we then uh, attract private sector against the investment that we're making? What we're talking about the blended finance, how do you achieve blended finance if your intergovernmental fiscal transfers are not geared towards uh, uh, attracting private sector. That's for me, that's the first thing that I think we need to tackle and make sure that we use the grant system that we have uh, in such a way that it is easy for private sector to use it to project in terms of whether they should uh, invest in that particular municipality or not. 
apparently uh, many of our municipalities will agree with me, they are not uh, credit worthy and they don't have uh, any uh, revenue base, uh, they don't have any balance, strong balance sheet, and the only thing they have is the intergovernmental fiscal transfers from national government. And how do we then uh, make sure that we use that lever that we have to get private sector involved? So that's Mr. the Vimba, first point Mr. Vimba. Is very important. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. I think that that point is, is well made, and we're going to have to maybe pause you on that point because uh, I want to give uh, some of the, the uh, other panelists okay. an opportunity. So I'll have to pause you there, okay. but I think it's a perfect segue uh, to, to my question for you, Heather. Uh, Heather Jackson from Ashburton Investments. Uh, and and if I guess it, it's related to, to the point that Mr. Vimba was making, which is that uh, if we continue with business as usual, you might end up having a lot of private sector money following projects into the metros and effectively not financing projects where they need it the most, especially if those projects don't have a cost recovery component, uh, which is what many of your investors would want, right? They would want some predictable cash flows to, to finance their interest or coupon payments or or, or whatever obligations are due to them. What are some of the things we can do for infrastructure that might not have a cost recovery component in the immediate uh, uh, to a crowd in private sector investment there uh, in a way that is meaningful, but where we can effectively share some of the risks and the costs involved? Sure. Um, for that, and yes, it's a very vexed um, issue that one's trying to solve for here. Um, I think there are two points that I'd like to make. The one is, that in terms of um, attracting um, private funding, and when we say private funding, we also remember that if we're talking, for example, about pension funds or insurance schemes, the underlying owners of those are actually you and me. Um, so it's it's all South Africans. Um, and, and so the first point to make is that there is a fiduciary responsibility to safeguard those returns. Um, you know, this is, this is not, um, kind of a, a free piggy bank um, and and so you do need to find those investments that do have qualified risk return profiles um, of which there are many and and so I think that's the starting point the starting point is to draw in those investors into credible um, investment opportunities that are credit enhanced you know that have this concessional or subordinated layer in terms of the blended finance um, the guarantee mechanism or the, what you know whatever it is there are lots of ways of solving for that um, that that's you know to to actually encourage what is quite a reluctant um, savings industry um, they've they've you know many feel they've had their fingers um, burnt somewhat so I think the other very important thing for government, is to, and Mr. Vimber touched on it now, is to sing, signal adequately from government that, you know, this is business unusual now, and that um, the kinds of constraints, be they regulatory or, or whatever, um, are, are actually going to be dealt with and signal that strongly. Another really important one is the REIT program. Get it back up and running. It was, it was great. Um, you know, so there's some pretty, pretty powerful, simple um, fixes that I, I believe are, are possible. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, let me bring in Mr. Campbell, and uh, I think you would have certainly had some comments. Uh, what are some of the, I guess, two or three things? Uh, uh, maybe let me not give you two one because. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think you've run out of time. No, no, I'm. I'm I I'm have. That. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, just one thing that you think in the immediate can be done to catalyze investment in the space. Um, I think the one most important thing is that. Uh, in fact, I'm going to take license. It's it's two rolled into one. So <laughs> this is a good talk. I heard the other say this is a talk shop. I'd let, I'd hate to think this is a talk shop. I think it's the beginning of an action. So we need now to be the bird that flies off the wire, not the bird deciding to fly and still being on that wire 10 years later. And secondly, it is the one opportunity for us as a country of a collective patriot uh, uh, citizen, citizenry, either in government or private sector, to get our country on track and build, rebuild the trust deficit that has unfortunately happened over time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that brief input, Mr. Mfebe. Let me bring you in here. You made an interesting point about uh, retrofitting for purpose uh, some of our uh, human settlements. Uh, 
in terms of the just transition, but also in terms of connectivity. Um, and I'm quite interested in the one thing that you think can be done to achieve that outcome, but also in the aggregate, much, much better outcomes uh, in public private partnerships that we've seen in the past. Is an ample opportunity for the private and the public sector to work together using proven uh, uh, technological and innovative uh, processes. Uh, I've referred to, uh, for an example, the issue of building a decent human settlement uh, uh, using uh, uh, 3D technology prefabrication of units not building on site, it makes quicker uh, production of houses at a very short time, at a very uh, a low cost, instead of traditional methods. We have to reimagine the way in which we deliver infrastructure. But part of that reimagination will not be possible if you still have people still trapped in the quagmire of antiquated thinking. Uh, who are still uh, 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 invested in control. And you need, therefore, to fix the SOE and municipal governance. That is where a lot of uh, 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 infrastructure uh, is failing at that level. And that takes us to the issue also of the, of the water boards. You need to put people who are fit for purpose in order to deliver uh, uh, this infrastructure to make it attractive to, to all okay. of us. All right, and Mr. Fabe, Mr. Fabe, Mr. Fabe, uh, I think the point is well made. We have to fix SOE governance, municipal governance. We have to sort out the water boards uh, and I guess uh, facilitating partnerships as well. I'm sorry to cut you off like that, uh, but unfortunately we're closely running out of time, uh, which leaves me with two minutes for Mr. Tati. Uh, uh, one of the first questions we got was actually directed at you. Uh, and it was a question saying, given the funds from the National Treasury and the limits in this regard, and I made the point earlier on of uh, the um, uh, non-compensation baseline reductions that came through in the February budget, which we might expect in the budget uh, over the next uh, 24 hours or so, uh, how do you see the private sector funding some of these projects and maybe some closing remarks from the department reflecting on the conversations we've had for the last two hours or so? Uh, thank you, Ebon. <clears throat> on the broader budget shortfall question, let me reflect firstly on what is happening intergovernmentally. That we know the impact of COVID. I don't have to repeat, but greater effort today is really looking at where um, are the budget chunks sitting within each family, within a human settlement, water and sanitation. We're looking at. There are multiple institutions within these departments. How can we leverage on each other's balance sheets? And I think some of the balance sheets are under leveraged, under resourced. There are those that are typically standing in good position and with very advanced projects that are ready for implementation. So the minister is pulling together these institutions to begin to talk to one another. Um, and there are broader challenges. I'm not going to waste time to everybody about that. The third layer. Uh, second layer is really looking at areas where there's under expenditure, um, where funds have been set aside for whatever plans that were in the beginning, where there's under utilization is to realign those two areas of priority. And then, of course, what the national government and other institutions at institutional level is looking into international funding agencies. So there's a, a, a serious effort really to look into that shortfall in broad terms. Um, there was another point which relates to the and the utilization of professionals. Uh, sitting where I am, I tend to be confused because I read documentation based on research that talks to shortage of skills um, broadly in the sector. And then I understand the shortage of skills within the state, which is abundant in the private sector. I'm not sure where the reality sits now when I'm hearing there's some unemployed capacity. And I don't want to push back. The, the, the message I would leave is that the moment these mega catalytic projects kickstart, I bet you these skills will be drawn into those segments in, in large numbers. And of course. The, the challenge really is to kickstart these projects and ensure that they, they move. You will know very well because the question links to private sector. It normally will not come in until government takes a lead 
lead not so much in the capacitation of the project, but in um, mitigating the risks in taking uh, a position which otherwise a private sector investor would not have. There were talks here about cushioning the pension funds, putting guarantees around them. The apex institution that's envisaged within human settlement is wanting to do exactly that. How do we uh, de-risk the project? How do we cushion private sector so that its risk perception on each one of these um, is not as high as it would be if the government was not there? So the government will have to play a leading role. That's what the apex institution is looking at. Uh, Maybe let me jump because I've got a few comments, but I don't want to, to take the time. If you listen very well, uh, Ayabon, consistently in all our presentation, we talk about the need to capacitate the state. But quite frankly, let's look at these things. The common touch point in all of them is local government. You will never run any infrastructure project unless it has gone through one point of decision making by local government. If I were to make strong suggestions, to our own government is to reorientate this thing, to deploy the highest levels of skills at the local government level and make sure that we attract that talent and keep it there and avoid the, 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 the historical um, gaps that have happened. Uh, I will say it here, but I'm not sure I'll be popular because I'm representing the minister. Um, a lot of journalists have written about the cadre deployment, that it doesn't help in the delivery system. The state needs to look at how do we bet, I mean, some of the panelists have, have mentioned, put people who are fit for purpose, people who are well qualified to execute on the job. Unless that area of the fundamental delivery, which my minister, I know every time there are questions being asked, she says, please understand mm -hmm. national government is doing a separate role in relation to what the local government. When people are talking about there's no water in rural areas, the delivery agent of the state is local and government. So in all of these areas where we talk today of the problems that I experienced on the ground, local government has got a touch point. I think to me, that's a big takeout in this conversation, that if infrastructure has to be unpacked and roll out in, in a sustainable fashion as we envisage, mm. let's fix and take a leadership at the local government level. Sure. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and Dr. Tati, uh, I think many of your colleagues in the presidency and at COCTA would be happy with you for your plug there of I guess uh, the need for the district development model, because effectively that's what you've done. I mean, that's the rationale for why we need uh, all tools on deck or all hands on deck uh, where the delivery happens and where the delivery agents are. And I think uh, the picture painted by many colleagues of uh, uh, what is taking root at that level uh, is probably in the immediate where we ought to be intervening. And uh, uh, I think many of my colleagues in another uh, a discussion on the district development model will be picking up some of those issues. But I want to take this opportunity uh, to, to maybe close our conversations. Uh, we probably run over by about 10 minutes or so, and I really appreciate the indulgence and the patience of many of my panelists uh, who have given of their time, their expertise. Uh, and thank you very much to all of you. Siswe, uh, Desigan, uh, uh, Chris, Webster, and Dandas, or Heather. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you for taking time to speak to us. Big thank you to Andy Sani uh, for moderating some of the questions that have come through. And everybody who sent through questions and participated uh, in the session, I think uh, we had about 80-something participants in this conversation uh, at its height. And, and that, I guess, that, I guess, speaks volumes of the interest of many South Africans uh, in this conversation. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all uh, for uh, joining us for this conversation. And may the conversation long continue. Uh, I think the conversation cannot end here, and it's important that, uh, as um, Mr. Webster was saying, that we continue to communicate and we do so fre frequently and consistently, uh, because that's what's going to make uh, um, and give meaning to uh, many of the partnerships that we've been talking about here, which uh, in no stretch of the imagination are only just about money. So thank you very much to my panelists, and thank you to the Department of Human Settlements, Water and Sanitation for putting this together. Uh, uh, but Sizwe, you'll send our regards to uh, Minister Sisulu uh, and uh, our message that may the conversation long continue beyond this. Thank you. Thank you, Abon. Uh, well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.